Welcome to Women's History Month at Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. We're going to be looking at some fascinating women in history, and I'm thrilled you're here to join us as we do so. Welcome, everyone. I am so glad you're with us. We have a real treat in store today. Sylvia Barber Soberton is joining us to talk about her latest book, as well as some other things. I have some other questions for her and really get us into a part of history we don't always hear as much about, sort of what's going on behind the scenes um, from those serving the royals. So Sylvia, welcome to Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. I'm so delighted to have you on the show. Well, hello. I'm very, very excited to be here. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sylvia Barbara Soberton. I'm an author, historian, and researcher specializing in the Tudor period and especially history of Tudor women. I wrote several books about Tudors, including my Forgotten Tudor Women series um, and Medical Downfall of the Tudors. Those are my uh, new books. And the very new book that I wrote um, last year is entitled Ladies in Waiting, Women Who Served Anne Boleyn. And I'm very, very excited to talk about this book today. Well, we are so excited to hear from you. Now, tell us how you got interested in history and especially in the Tudors and, as you say, particularly Tudor women. So uh, when I was a child, I kept hearing about Henry VIII, who had six wives. And, you know, when I was a kid... I, I I always got it mixed up. I didn't know if it was Henry the Sixth who had eight wives <laughs> or <laughs> Henry the Eighth who had six wives. So I definitely heard a lot about the Tudors growing up. But then um I was I was watching this TV series, The Tudors, and I got really interested in that. And it really kind of how it started for me. So I was researching the subject, you know, uh season after season. Was that true? Was this true? And it Quite, it's quite how I became interested in in this particular period in history. How I became, how I started studying it, and how I, you know, started writing about it. So I say it's because of the Tudors, and um, I think it's great that this kind of um, depictions on TV bring period to life because it's how people become interested. And, you know, and I became a historian and historical writer because of that. So <laughs> look what it can get you. <laughs> That's a great point. And I know sometimes there's a debate and you mentioned a mm-hmm. question you brought to the tutors, which was, is this true? Is this true? And sometimes mm-hmm. it is, and sometimes it's not. But as you started, I'd love to know, as you started researching to find out what was true and what was not, and you turned to writing books, how do you approach research and what kinds of research did you do sort of early on? And then as you got into your writing, what kinds of research did you do? I'd love an idea of that. Before I started professionally like writing about the tutors, I just I was just interesting interested in what's true and what's not just for myself. So mm-hmm. I started with really basic stuff like what did Anne Boleyn really look like or uh, myths about her like did she really had six finger who wrote that mm-hmm. and you know her reputation and and stuff like that. And then when I just you know uh, decided that I will be writing books about it I approached it from a different angle because I started doing archival research. So when I already had this, a lot of knowledge about the Tudors from my studies and from reading secondary sources, I turned to the archival sources. And because I don't live in the UK, so it's a little bit tricky for me. Mm-hmm. But I, I I, think when you want to uh, research it, uh, you know, from the archives, you can do it even if you don't live in the UK because you can always travel there. You can always order the doc- the documents. Um, a lot of documents are also digitized these days, so it's not as difficult as it would have been, 
if I was living in the 19th century, like Agnes right. Strickland, for example. Right. <laughs> yes. Um, because I, I find myself thinking about her a lot um, and about Marianne Everett Wood as well, because, you know, they were female historians in the 19th mm-hmm. century mm-hmm. and writing about the Tudors. And okay, they, especially Agnes, they spread a lot of misinformation and myths. But when you go through their books, um, they actually had quite detailed information about the letters, about the documents. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have a lot of admiration for them. And as I write about the Tudors, you know, being a woman, writing about Tudor women, I think about these 19th century pioneers in Tudor history, I would say. And it actually makes me want to research them a lot, too. <laughs> Right, you know, because it must have been difficult, you know, to be a woman to be writing mm-hmm. about the Tudors, you know, in the at the time when you didn't have an access to the archives like we mm-hmm. do, or to the books, secondary sources even like we do today. So today, I would say it's so very easy to to be finding information, um, even if they are, you know closed in the archives but you know people in in these uh, institutions are very friendly and mm-hmm. um it's it's really wonderful i i would say the the 21st century is a wonderful time to be writing about the tudors because you know the knowledge at your fingertips it's it's amazing it is and i really appreciate a couple of things first of all we do sometimes um criticize agnes strickland uh, for oh, spreading yeah. some misinformation and yet in her day, what she was doing was, you know, groundbreaking research. She was looking mm-hmm. at things and, and some of the information she got access to and was able to write about wasn't known before. And there was a lot of information <laughs> during those times. It's not all her, right? And so we do need to appreciate the work she did, even though we now know more. But another mm-hmm. thing, you know, a lot of the institutions, the British Library and the National Archives, a couple of places that I, you know, I don't live in the UK either, that I've traveled to. The people there mm-hmm. have been wonderful and friendly and helpful. Exactly. And mm-hmm. also, if you do get a reader's card and you can do that, you don't have to be a university professor, have a project you're working on that mm-hmm. does give you exactly. some different access online as well. So it's worth getting your reader's card, even if you're not going to be there in Mm -hmm. person because there are other things available to you. So that's great. I really appreciate you mentioning that, Mm -hmm. that, that we can do that. You know, all of us can, you know, use the unbelievable resources, particularly British Library and National Archives. Those are just a couple to mention. All right. Mm -hmm. So you're interested in the tutors and you start getting interested in tutor women. And I do Mm -hmm. want to talk specifically about this book because the Tudor, some of the Tudor women, I mean, Anne Boleyn is certainly an incredibly famous Tudor woman and Elizabeth the first, but you're not just looking at sort of the front of the stage with these characters. You are looking at some of the women who served Anne Boleyn that we don't know that much about. So can you tell us a little bit about your research in terms of how did you find information about some of these less well-known, maybe less frequently written about women who served Anne Boleyn? The idea behind this book was that much emphasis is usually put on Anne Boleyn's relationships with the men in her life. So her Mm -hmm. suitors, her royal husband, her father and her brother, and of course the men who were her putative lovers and who were executed uh, on 17 May of 1536. And no comprehensive analysis of her ladies-in-waiting has ever been attempted until now. Um, And some women from Anne's household, like the infamous Lady Rochford, Mm -hmm. Uh, still blamed for, you know, Anne's downfall are well known to both academic and general audiences, but the facts of their lives are often um, imprecise or even misinterpreted. And so at the center of this study is the list of uh, women from Anne Boleyn's household who attended her coronation in 1533. And this document is a very voluminous one and is currently preserved in the British Library. 
and it's it's a manuscript in general terms well known to scholars. It contains information on the christening, coronations, um, creations of royal and noble personages from the reign of Henry V to Elizabeth I. So a lot of information contains uh, in there. Um, parts of this manuscript relate to Anne Boleyn's coronations coronation and it's often cited but and there's always a but uh, <laughs> the part of the manuscript with the whole list of her ladies in waiting and maids of honor who took part in the coronation procession is almost never discussed in the Boleyn scholarship um, I can think of two scholars who used this list to discuss it a little bit but that was you know just only scratching the surface I went into the whole you know, into the detail. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, this list, when I first found out about it, it really was like a revelation to me. Like, wow, there's a, an actual list of the women who served Anne Boleyn, who took part in her coronation procession. I mean, are you joking? <laughs> and I was very interested in terms of, you know, Tudor women, just who served whom and mm -hmm. how these women transferred from one household to another, because we know that Henry VIII changed wives very quickly and swiftly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was always very interested in how these women kind of transferred from Catherine, you know, from Catherine of Aragon to Anne Boleyn, from Anne Boleyn to Jane Seymour and so on and so on. And so, uh, to me personally, this list is very important because it gives the names of Anne Boleyn's most intimate servants. Um, so other sources from this period, such as letters, chronicles, memoirs, and household expenses, often mention these exact women. Uh, so that's how I knew that this, this is gold, that this is very important, and that I wanted to study it in detail, and that I wanted to kind of... Um, see if I'm seeing and encountering these women in other sources, which I did. And so, yeah, this list is at the center of the study and um, it's it's my most important piece because it's, it was like never, almost never discussed in the Boleyn scholarship, which I found very, very interesting. That is interesting. And it's a good reminder to all of us, I think, that mm -hmm. these sources are wonderful and often you just look somewhere else in the source and you can find something like you did, something that's not discussed but is such valuable and amazing information. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that like with Anne Boleyn, we think we know everything about her because uh, she's just such an important Tudor woman and so many people are studying her. But we can still find new information if we dig deep enough and if we approach the subject like with an open mind. Like mm -hmm. I can learn something new and it can change my understanding of Anne Boleyn like any day. Um, and also I was quite surprised to see how many myths are still out there about her and repeated uh, by even notable scholars. So, you know, I always approach any subject, and especially Anne Boleyn, with a very open mind. So um, I think that uh, the, the readers and listeners will be um, surprised to learn some new facts, perhaps, or, or some uh, or some things that they thought were facts and turn out to be myths. So, mm. yeah. Well, if you could take maybe just a couple of the women that you found particularly interesting in your research and writing, and tell us a little bit about them and what you learned about some of these women that might be, you know, might've been a surprise to you and might be a surprise to people who haven't thought as much in the past. Now they will, but maybe haven't thought as much in the past about these ladies in waiting. When I started researching this book, and it was a long time ago, almost at the beginning of my uh, studies and the beginning of my fascination with Anne Boleyn, I wanted to know more about Anne Gainsford, who, uh, who is very often present in the narrative of Anne Boleyn's life and death. And um, I, I just wanted to learn about her relationship with Anne, uh, who this Anne Gainsford was, and why is she so important. Um, and as I started researching, um, 
you know, it's 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 an it's an established fact uh, in scholarship that Anne Gainsford was um, an informant of George Wyatt. George Wyatt was the grandson of the poet Thomas Wyatt, and he wrote the first ever biography of Anne Boleyn around 1606. And Wyatt says that, well, his two informants were uh, one woman who was his own relative and who knew a lot of things about Anne, and the other was an elderly lady who uh, used to serve serve in Anne Boleyn's household. And um, I can tell you that it wasn't Anne Gainsford <laughs> because uh, this is a myth. This is a myth. This this one was quite surprising to learn. Um, but it's uh, Wyatt's um, editor, Samuel Weller Singer, um, he identified this unknown woman as Anne Gainsford because Wyatt never, never gave us any names. He just said, well... I've had these two informants, two women, and he said nothing about who they were. Mm -hmm. um, and this Samuel Weller singer, he identified this woman as Anne Gainsford. And, you know, it's difficult to blame him because he uh, identified her because at the same time as he was um, publishing uh, Wyatt's work, there was already... Um, an edition of John Fox's uh, book about uh, Book of Martyrs. And mm -hmm. he had this um, reminiscence of John Luth. Um, and in this reminiscence, mem you know, like this memoir, mini memoir, there was this um, story of how Anne Gainsford uh, borrowed a book from Anne Boleyn, mm -hmm. and it was The Obedience of a Christian Man by William Tyndale. And, uh, you know, Luth, who was a contemporary, he uh, identified, you know, Anne Gainsford as Anne Gainsford because he knew that the story was circulating. And uh, so, you know, Singer just, you know, he, he, he immediately probably thought, oh, so if Anne Gainsford appears in that narrative and Wyatt had a similar, similar narrative, so it must be her. Uh, so that's why he identified this unknown woman from Anne's household as Anne Gainsford. But from what I can tell you, um, you know, Anne Gainsford died before Wyatt was even born. So she could not have been his informant. So that that was kind of really something that uh, I found very interesting, interesting because, you know, you can check this fact, you know, when did Anne Gainsford die? If you dig deep enough, you can have this uh, basic uh, narrative of her life and death. And it's, you know, quite evident that she died before, some five years before Wyatt was even born. So obviously mm -hmm. she could not have been his informant, but it's still repeated as fact, which is interesting and shows just, mm -hmm. you know, like we have to double check everything. Like I double check everything. <laughs> right. I, 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 I used to, um, you know, approach and story uh, from like this, um, like I trust what's written about her because I do. But at the same time, we are finding out that even in biographies, of Anne Boleyn, of, let's say, Eric Ives. There are mm -hmm. still some, I would say, myths and perhaps some um, incorrect information. So we shouldn't be like, oh, like, you know, this great scholar writes something and I can't, you know, correct him uh, or her, you know, um, mm -hmm. because, you know, we're just humans. We're just people and we make mistakes. And scholarship is all about, you know, going forward, learning from our uh, you know, from people and historians who came before us. So learning right. from them, but also taking what they knew and, you know, scrutinizing it. Is it true? How did they know it? Is the source mm -hmm. correct? What's the source? And so on and so on. That's how we move forward as scholars, as writers, as, mm -hmm. you know, historians. As historians. Right. And we need to remember that, you know, you, you find something in a contemporary source, but those mm -hmm. contemporary sources they had their own agendas as well. Exactly. So just like if you find something written today, if you find news accounts, you know, sometimes people writing the story have their own agendas. And yeah. you're right. We continue to learn more and find new things and reinvestigate stories we thought we knew. And that's what keeps the scholarship exciting and keeps these people really alive. 
Mm-hmm. So yes, when you when you think about Anne Boleyn and the women around her, and you're right, we tend to think about Anne Boleyn and the men around mm-hmm. her. But how important were those women? I think sometimes we do forget Anne Boleyn was a human being. I know when I hear people talk about her sometimes, um, the humanity, the fact that she had bad days and worries and, you know, her own concerns. How important were the women around her during maybe some of her quieter moments or um, some of her transitions? And, and, you know, the public may have felt one way, and we can talk about that too, but how did the women around her feel? We do have uh, information about, you know, information about Anne Boleyn's women and how they felt, feel about her and how she felt about them, you know, they are scattered all over the place. So we have to kind of weave the story and, you know, go here, go there to see if we can have any glimpses of her women, you know, talking about her. Uh, just in general terms, terms, I can tell you that, you know, Anne's own rise to queenship it set a dangerous precedent. And she was aware that the women who served her were her potential rivals for the king's affection. And she decided to make her household a place untouched by scandals. So she, for example, laid out William Tyndale's translation of the New Testament in her privy chamber as a reminder for her maids and ladies to lead chaste and moral lives. Um, And although Henry VIII chose ladies from Anne's household as his mistresses during their marriage, uh, one of the Queen's silk women, Joan Wilkinson, later recalled in a conversation with John Fox that she never saw a better order among the ladies and gentlemen of the court than it was in the time of Anne Boleyn. So I think that's Mm. telling. That's very interesting. Um, So also... um, the roles that ladies in waiting had, uh, it would be just to accompany her like every day, uh, every minute of every day. So from the morning until night, and even at night, there would be a woman who would sleep on a pallet bed with Anne in her own bedchamber. So she was never alone. She was never alone. And um, she probably had close friendships with the women who served her because, uh, you know, in the 16th century, it was um, uh, a custom actually to refer to your household and to your servants as your family. And you would see that very often in Catherine of Aragon's letters to her father, Ferdinand of Aragon, uh, when she was, uh, before she married Henry VIII. So she was referring to her women, especially as her family because she felt like she needed to provide their the dowries for her, you know, give them money and so on and so on. And uh, Anne Boleyn probably felt the same about the women who served her. And she also had, she had her actual family uh, serving her. So, for example, her sister, her sister-in-law uh, and other uh, members of her, uh, you know, the Howard clan, the Boleyn family, they also served her. So, uh, because, you know, Anne Boleyn was in this um, interesting situation that she was an English woman and she had family who wanted to serve her. And also it was safe to surround herself with members of her own family because it was, you know, not a lot of chances that they would betray her uh, mm-hmm. because, you know, her rise was their rise as well. And if she... If she was, uh, if she lost the affection of the king, you know, they would lose it too. Uh, so surrounding herself with the members of her family was actually a very sensible thing to do, I think. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, when we think about Anne Boleyn, I think a lot of people imagine that she had, you know, this maybe three or four women who, who served her, but it was, you know, the whole court you know, household full of, full of women. And and it's really interesting to kind of delve deeper into that and to see uh, what kind of relationships she had with them because they were her friends, but they were also her enemies. And it was very difficult to just, you know, walk 
uh, you know, knowing that there are people who scrutinize you, you, you know, mm-hmm. they looked at you and, you know, every mistake that you make, uh, you know, look, they were looking at you, whether you were pregnant or not, you know, and, you know, to be surrounded by people 24 hours a day, I think was very difficult. And, you know, Elizabeth I later, many years later, she would say, you know, that a thousand eyes see what I do. So it was really difficult to mm-hmm. kind of hide and be private because privacy was, you know, very great commodity, I would say. Um, so I think Anne would have felt similar like her daughter mm-hmm. felt. Um, and also we will probably talk about it, but, you know, the Anne Boleyn's downfall, it was also said to have been... Um, emanating from her female household. So that's very interesting. Um, right. And it's also, you know, kind of part of the narrative in my book where I mm-hmm. um, kind of concentrate on um, how, 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 how did her women uh, step forward with these damning accusations? And was it true, you know, what they said? And what did they say, actually? So, you know, I think right. it's also interesting, yeah. Okay, before we go there, because I do want to definitely talk about that. But before we get to the downfall, Mm -hmm. I wanted to mention and something else you talk about, but the idea that Anne was not generally popular with the English people, but it seems like in particular, women in England were not fond of her. They did not look to her as their mentor or an example um, and mm-hmm. can you talk a little bit about that? Why might that be? So Anne Boleyn set a like this um, precedence because she was she herself was a maid of honor in the household of Catherine of Aragon, and Catherine of Aragon was a very uh, popular queen. Um, and the divorce, uh, okay, we today refer to it as a divorce, but it was actually an annulment. So this Mm -hmm. annulment made Catherine even more popular with the people because from the very beginning, uh, it was evident that Henry VIII was looking to marry another woman, to marry Anne Boleyn. And so it made people, and especially women, to sympathize with Catherine of Aragon because if Catherine of Aragon as queen could not feel safe in her marriage, if the king could just discard his wife of 20 years and marry his mistress, because that's how Anne Boleyn was perceived by many as mistress, Mm -hmm. as royal mistress, even though, you know, she wasn't his mistress in a carnal sense. Uh, But if, if a queen could be discarded, so other women could, this could be discarded as well. And so they kind of felt this um, solidarity with the discarded wife, uh, with their queen. And, it, especially after Catherine of Aragon's exile from court in 1531, you know, Henry VIII was not really hiding with Anne Boleyn anymore. And mm-hmm. they were, for example, riding out with, you know, to hunt together. And Anne was riding, uh, like holding the king. Uh, it was called riding pillion, which means that Henry would uh, like hold Anne Boleyn and they would ride on on horseback together. So that's very mm-hmm. shocking and scandalous, you know, for a man to do, especially if he, if he had a wife. And, right. you know, the women saw Anne Rice as an assault on traditional moral values and just women as a whole, whether they were noble ladies serving at court or just common fishwives, you know, they did not warm to Anne Boleyn because they perceived mm-hmm. her as this haughty and scandalous usurper, actually. And some were audacious enough to heap slanders at her when she rode out with the king, while others just decided to proceed with more drastic measures. So, for example, we have this example in the Venetian ambassador's uh, dispatch that one afternoon in October of 1531, Anne was supping with the king at a friend's house on the river. And suddenly uh, they received a warning that a mob of seven or eight thousand angry women was marching uh, to seize Anne. Uh, You know, they were marching from the city of London and, you know, we don't know what the intent was. The ambassador Mm -hmm. thought that they wanted to kill her. Um, And so Anne stepped hastily into the boat and she escaped, uh, undoubtedly shaken, but not harmed. But, you know, this incident, I think it's real. I think, you know, because I saw it's 
sometimes people think, oh, but that's just an exaggeration. It didn't happen, you know. But I think it did happen because just um, from the amount of information that we have about how unpopular Anne was before she became queen and afterwards, uh, I think it's impossible to dismiss this as just, Mm -hmm. you know, like an anecdote because this was a serious thing and it was just not pursued like Henry didn't pursue that further to punish the people who were responsible for that because it was said you know okay it was a thing done by women so women kind kind of got away with it um it was probably also to conceal how much how unpopular Anne was among women at that time like- Certainly, Henry didn't want to focus on how unpopular Anne was Definitely, since she yeah. was his choice. <laughs> mm. So, yes, that's in his his best interest, too. Yes, there's also this interesting um, thing that Edward Hall, the chronicler, wrote mm-hmm. in his chronicle from, uh, you know, he wrote that some ladies and other servants of Catherine of Aragon, uh, they started spreading rumors about Anne uh, that Henry VIII was enticed to um, divorce Catherine because he was so so in love with Anne, and I think that's that's also true because we have this contemporary information from uh, like sources like Eustace Chapuis, who says mm-hmm. uh, a lot of things about, uh, for example, how Anne Boleyn was. Uh, there were there were rumors that you know she used witchcraft to seduce the king, and we mm-hmm. we tend to think that witchcraft was added later by Anne's enemies. But actually, what I found is that um, the conservative circle at court used to say that Anne Boleyn um, used means to entice Henry VIII to unlawfully love her, and this unlawful mm. love had a witchcraft connotations because it was linked to witchcraft to seduction, you know. So, mm. you know, love potions and stuff like that. And, you know, we we tend to think that, oh, witchcraft, you know, just something that was added much later. But actually it's contemporary. And uh, so we have these families, like uh, family of Reginald Paul and of the Courtenays also, who are these, you know, old Catholic conservative families who mm-hmm. remained loyal to Catherine of Aragon through Henry VIII's divorce. And they actually hated Anne Boleyn and they would hate her until until her execution. Yes, and we forget how actively members of the court, as you say, conservative Catholic members of the court, mm-hmm. were still promoting Catherine of Aragon. I mean, yes. still trying to get Henry to go back to her and the Pope continued to try and get Henry to go back to her. So even... Once Henry's made his decision, it doesn't mean that Anne is not still being um, vilified from contemporaries. So mm-hmm. again, they're making up stories and some of those, you know, rumors sort of trickle down as if they're facts. So it's it's mm-hmm. a very interesting time when you think about it, um, what, what it must have been like at court where mm-hmm. rumors were so potent and used to damage. And of course, women's reputation, if you can make them seem sexually depraved, that was a big way of destroying a woman's reputation. So uh, all of that is so interesting and is a good way to talk about, to sort of segue us into talking about her downfall, because that's Mm -hmm. what was used for her downfall. And I know there are lots of statements or people say that her women turned against her and that was such compelling evidence. So can you talk about her women and some of those stories and what you found during Anne's downfall? When Anne is arrested, um, Thomas Cromwell writes to the king's ambassadors in France that the accusations of adultery uh, emanated from Anne Boleyn's female household that her ladies-in-waiting and uh, maids of honor just couldn't contain uh, this depravity of Anne Boleyn within their breasts, you know, that was the what Cromwell said, and that they just decided to uh, inform the authorities about it. And, you know, Cromwell was very clever in that he decided to use the women 
because they were first they were with Anne Boleyn like every day, every minute of the day. They knew what she did. Uh, they knew how she spent her days, and so he thought probably that it would have been believable if he said, "Well, her women stepped forward with the damning accusations against Anne mm-hmm. Boleyn." Um, but was it actually true? Well, uh, one eyewitness who was at court at the time was said that the first accusers were Elizabeth uh, uh, Somerset, Countess of Worcester, and Nan Cabham, with one maid more. So he actually named three women. But he said also that everything was so discreetly spoken that it was actually impossible to learn anything of substance. So that we do have these three women, uh, even though one of them is unnamed, is actually, we are very lucky. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but what I, th- what I think is very interesting is that Jane Boleyn, who supposedly gave evidence that contributed to Anne's downfall, uh, she is, you know, most prominent in the narrative of Anne's fall, but the women who were actually named as first accusers are not so often mentioned. So I I found this very interesting because, mm-hmm. you know, Jane Boleyn, she's said to have been this wicked wife who testified against George and Anne Boleyn. Um, but that's from la- from much later on. Actual Her actual involvement in the trials comes, you know, narrows down to just one um, one uh, statement written on a piece of paper and handed to George Boleyn that she says um, that Anne Boleyn confided in her that Henry VIII uh, didn't have a skill as a lover and that he was possibly an impotent. And it was, you know, mm-hmm. it was an explosive statement. It was very dangerous to kind of, you know, even say that. But mm-hmm. um, it's... It's not what uh, what was the main reason behind Anne Boleyn's, you know, uh, downfall. Um, we we don't know what the women said, but we can in, kind of infer that from uh, from the accounts written by, for example, by um, Yusuf Shapui, who is kind of our main informant about the. Um, the accusations and also they bag of the secretis, which is the bag of secrets. Very nice name. Right. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. So we we can infer, you know, what they said from that. But uh, no witnesses were called to testify during the actual trial of Anne or of her brother jo- George. So they were not confronted, uh, and that's interesting in itself. Uh, right. So. There is also this um, poem by Lancelot de Carle, who was a secretary to the French ambassador. And he says, well, there is this woman at court and he didn't identify her, but she is identified as Elizabeth Somerset, Countess of Worcester. And she's pregnant and she is scorned, uh, you know, um, she is um, lashed out by her brother. He says, well, you're pregnant and you, you know, your husband is not the father of your child. And she, to kind of justify uh, herself to him, says, well, you should look really into the queen's household because, you know, there are a lot of things going on there. And it's kind of how um, this um, investigation into her conduct was launched. Uh, That's, you know, the story in the poem. But this poem, you know, is very closely um, related to what Thomas Cromwell says later on. So it's believed that the poem is very accurate in terms of what went on. Um, but we don't know what exactly was said. We just we can infer that women were asked, and Thomas Cromwell said that they were asked and interrogated very secretly. So Anne Boleyn probably didn't <laughs> know what was really going on until she was arrested. And also mm. she wasn't really presented with the whole list of charges until until she was in the tower and she was informed that she was to be accused of adultery and she was pretty shocked by that um and even you know how many men she was accused of and who was accused of as her lover it wasn't revealed to her uh i think 
about three days into her uh, mm. into her um, imprisonment, and she herself later also provided some scraps of you know evidence because she was very distraught. She was blabbing, oh, you know, oh maybe Francis Weston, oh maybe you know, oh if, you know Henry Norris, and so on and so on. Mm-hmm. And um, she had an inkling that something was going on because. Also, this, you know, kind of um, what Cromwell did, it doesn't look like he was amassing evidence for months or for years. He was just, right. it looks like, you know, it happened, you know, in a in a matter of days because, you know, Anne Boleyn had this quarrel with Henry Norris and talking about dead men's shoes. And it it pops out during the, right. uh, the trial that she probably had, you know, it, had it planned that she would marry one of her lovers after the king dies. Uh, and you know, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, right. But I wanted to talk maybe a little more about this Elizabeth Somerset, Countess of Worcester, who was said by an eyewitness to have been uh, Anne Boleyn's first accuser. And when Anne Boleyn was arrested, well, she said that she um, that actually this, the Countess of Worcester. Uh, was pregnant and that her baby didn't move in her belly because of the trouble and the sorrow that she felt for me. So it 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 means that they were very close. And indeed, right. there are there is evidence that they were close because Anne borrowed her some money and mm-hmm. uh, it was one hundred pounds. So it was a lot of money for that time. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, the countess did, she didn't inform her husband about how much she borrowed from Anne. So that's interesting that she would do something behind her husband's back like this and that, you know, and that Anne assisted her. Um, Also, Privy Poor's expenses of Henry VIII show that uh, there was money paid to um, the Countess's um, um, midwife when she gave birth to her child. So that's another, you know, very intimate kind of gift and only to people who were really close with right. the uh, with the king and you know Anne Boleyn was Henry VIII's loved love interest at the time, so I can see her hand in it. Um, and you know after Anne Boleyn's fall, when she died, uh, the countess actually gave birth to that child that seemingly did not move in her belly mm-hmm. when Anne was arrested, and that child was born in September of 1536, and she was named Anne. So I find that's very interesting. Why would very the Countess of Worcester name her child after the late the late Queen? Um, also, this girl Anne would later foment trouble for Elizabeth I, but that's you know another story. <laughs> <laughs> and what I think is also interesting is that the Countess of Worcester she died in 1565, so she outlived. Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII, she saw uh, Henry VIII's children, uh, you know, so his son, his daughter Mary Mm -hmm. become queen. And she saw Elizabeth I become queen, so Anne Boleyn's daughter. And there is this, she wrote her last will because she was widowed at the time, uh, you know, only widows were uh, allowed to write their own wills. And in this last will, she says, well, I leave this gown that I attended the Queen's coronation, so Elizabeth I's coronation, to my daughter. Um, and I find it very interesting because it places her, the Countess of Worcester, uh, mm-hmm. during Elizabeth's coronation. So I, I'm thinking, like, imagining what was she thinking, uh, you know, when she when she watched mm-hmm. Anne Boleyn's daughter becoming queen because, you know, really, what were the odds yes. that Elizabeth would become queen because she was, you know, illegitimate and she had a brother and a sister before her. So that was, you know, quite amazing that she became queen. Well, and Lady Worcester had watched Anne Boleyn's fall happen really because Elizabeth had been her only child that she hadn't exactly. given the king a mm-hmm. son. So to see her become queen and attend the coronation. So it's really interesting when you look at all of the information we have about her, rather than just that one supposed comment, Mm -hmm. it just really changes the perspective on what her relationship was with Mm -hmm. Anne Boleyn. Exactly. So it's, yeah, it's very interesting. And, Mm -hmm. you know, even in a recent portrayal, on the sort of infamous Netflix series. She really does in that series turn against Anne. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interesting the way people interpret a portion 
of the evidence. Her women, Anne Boleyn's women, didn't really have um, any other choice but to say anything that Cromwell wanted them to say. Because yes. once Anne Boleyn was marked to be get gotten rid of, you know, she was... Yes. Basically, I, I, I don't want to say a dead woman because I think that many people at the time didn't quite imagine that a queen, an anointed queen, can be executed. And whatever they said, they probably said not with the intent, you know, not knowing that she would be killed, executed, murdered. Uh, so it's difficult to say, you know, that they were guilty, but they provided some scraps of information of what was just going on in Anne Boleyn's household. Like, you know, she danced in, yes. her, in her bedchamber with men. She exchanged letters with her brother um, and so on mm -hmm. and so on. So they were privy to a lot of things or that, she, you know, joked that, oh, maybe Elizabeth wasn't the king's child and so on and so on. Uh, you know, I don't think it was, it was malicious. I think it was just whatever they thought was... Um, Innocent and Cromwell misconstrued it to look like it was, you know, dangerous. And yes. Anne was just plotting to kill the king. And, you know, what would she have gained from having the king, you know, from him dead, you know, because he was her protector, really. And if he died, Absolutely. it would probably mean that she would have been ousted and her family would have been ousted and probably Mary would have become queen. Um, if, you know, yes. we, if we double into a little bit of alternative history of what ifs. But I think it's also very interesting is that following Anne's downfall, the Countess, you know, of Worcester, she writes this letter to Cromwell informing him that she borrowed money from Anne and that she believed that Anne would have been good to her if she had lived. And so, you know, it's pretty ludicrous if you if you think that, well, she was the first accuser and she and she still thinks that Anne <laughs> would have been good to her, you know, I don't think so. But it only sheds light on her role in Anne's downfall because if she said what she said with not with it, you know, without the intent of being malicious and, you know, Cromwell just taking whatever he wanted to take and uh, misconstruing it to just, you know, make Anne the worst adulteress in the kingdom, then, uh -huh. you know, the countess's involvement looks different from that point. So I think she didn't really it have depends. a choice. She just did whatever, just whatever, the, whatever Cromwell wanted to hear, you know, really. And... Yeah, I think it wasn't my it wasn't malicious, and you know I'm wondering what Elizabeth the first made of it because did she know that you know the countess was said to have to be her mother's first accuser or or maybe she didn't know you know maybe she didn't um, but you know a lot of women were still around when Elizabeth became queen, so if she wanted yeah. to learn more about her mother, I think she she could do it. But if she yes. if she if she's ever done that, we don't know. It's well, it is very interesting, and it does make us think because we know, you know that that time when Anne was going through her fall mm -hmm. was such a dangerous time, and if the queen was vulnerable, everybody was vulnerable, and so yes, people were saying what they needed to stay alive, and mm -hmm. I think that certainly included her household. Well, there's this, you know, this example of. One of Anne Boleyn's ladies, in, maids, maids of honor, she became lady in waiting later on when she married. But when she, it is, I'm talking about Marjorie Horseman, who was mm. um, very close with Anne Boleyn. She was her friend as well. And there is this evidence from uh, the vice chamberlain in Anne's household, uh, Edmund Bainton, who says, well, Marjorie Horseman doesn't want to tell me anything because of this great friendship that is between her and between the queen. So we can see that not every lady in waiting who was interrogated wanted to give evidence. And, you know, I think that they also didn't know what to say because they knew that anything that they are going to say will be used against the queen and misconstrued. And also during the fall of Catherine mm -hmm. Howard, there's also this interesting uh, quote from Jane Boleyn, who says, who says to Catherine Howard, well, you know what, they were going to be talking 
you know, all all sorts of stuff to you and they will be promising you a lot of things. But if you say too much, you will undo yourself and others. So I think she was talking from her own experience in 1536, yeah. you know, just warning the younger yes. woman, just war- warning the another queen who found herself in danger to, you know, just don't yes. talk too much, protect yourself, protect yes. your, you know, um, your position and your people. But, you know, we know how that ended. <laughs> Yes, yes, and it it is interesting to think of Jane Rochford in mm-hmm. you know having both of those experiences and being involved in both of them. Wow, how terrifying mm. um for her, for her. So, um I just want to ask you one more question about the book mm-hmm. and then I'm going to ask what you're working on now so we can know what's next. But oh. <laughs> if you were to say maybe one of the things that surprised you in your research about Anne Boleyn and her ladies, is there something Mm -hmm. that really surprised you? In the narratives of Anne Boleyn's uh, downfall in the secondary works, we often hear about Mistress Orchard, who was said to have been Anne Boleyn's governess from the time when she was a child and that she was attending Anne in the tower before Anne's uh, execution. And that she was also present at Anne Boleyn's trial and that that she shrieked out dreadfully when Anne Boleyn was proclaimed guilty. And I always assumed that it was true, you know, that Mrs. Orchard really existed. But what I found out was that she she didn't exist. It's a figment of an imagination of a 19th century historian. And I describe that Mm. in detail in the book. So that's one thing that really surprised me, that this Mistress Orchard didn't exist. I was very surprised by that. Shocked, kind of. Kind of shocked, I can, I can, I think that's that's the right word to say. Also, (laughs) um, another thing that really surprised me was that I always um, imagined that much Shelton Matt Shelton was, you know, a maid of honor of Anne Boleyn's and that she, you know, she was named Match or Margaret and that, you know, this, she was all called by her friends like Match. But what I found out is that there were two Shelton sisters. One was called Margaret and another, the other one was called Mary. And there was no Matt Shelton in Anne Boleyn's household or in the documents of the period. I found no Match Shelton. And this means that, you know, some historians, like somebody wrote, well, this was Matt Shelton, this was Margaret Shelton, and others just repeated that. But the the Lady Shelton from Anne Boleyn's household was Mary, and her name appears in uh, the Devonshire manuscript because she was a poet. She was at some point also Henry VIII's mistress. She was also Anne Boleyn's cousin, and there's this interesting um interesting uh, anecdote of how Anne was uh you know she noticed that Mary Shelton was scribing something in her prayer book and she said well you won't be inserting this vanton toys in your prayer book because that's inappropriate um you know it's funny that Anne Boleyn did that with <laughs> <laughs> Henry VIII uh, <laughs> during their own courtship. But, you know, she was probably chastising her because, you know, she knew how it ended mm. for her. Uh, so what surprised me was that Matt Shelton also didn't exist, that it was Mary Shelton who was Anne Boleyn's maid of honor, not Margaret Shelton, her sister, that Mary appears in the court records. And she also left court after Anne's execution. That's very interesting. That is wonderful. And it's always um, exciting as you're working on a project to be surprised. I think that's what keeps us going and working mm-hmm. on new projects is exactly. getting surprised. So thank you so much. Now, tell us a little bit about what you're doing now or projects you're even thinking about for the future. For now, the book that I have uh, finished and edited and uh, ready to be published is a book about um, Anne Boleyn's years spent in France and in the Netherlands. Um, I take a look at the women that she uh, served. So, for example, the Valois women, the uh, Mm -hmm. Margaret of Austria also. Uh, Margaret of Austria is my personal hero. That's one thing that I have finished and I'm planning to release pretty soon. Um, And another another book that I finished 
uh, writing some time ago, but it's not edited yet. So uh, long time to go. It's a book about Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn and how they kind of um, established their the um, courts, how they were rivals, mm-hmm. and how uh, their households looked like at the time when Henry VIII uh, was divorcing Catherine. So that's another thing mm. that that I'm planning to release soon. And also, I have very uh, many ideas. Some books I have started and not finished. So I'm probably going to finish some projects that are as yet okay. unfinished. Um, but for, for now, these two are my main focus. Um, yeah. Wow. That's it. So we have a lot to look forward to coming from you. Where can we follow you? I'm most active on Twitter, but I also have uh, a f- um, Facebook page and I'm also on Instagram. Okay. And I will have all those links in the show notes. So look for them there, everybody. Well, thank you so much. This has been such a delight. I love, you know, I love talking about Anne Boleyn and it's so interesting to think about her household and the women who were there during this amazing time of the courtship Mm -hmm. and then her marriage and queenship and then the fall, I mean, just the whole world changed in just a few years. And imagine exactly, yeah. being part of it. Oh, wow. So thank you so much for giving us sort of a glimpse, a way into that frightening, exciting, amazing world mm. of the Tudor court. Well, thank you for having me. It was so much fun. I'm very glad we did it. <laughs> well, I am too. And thank you, everyone for listening and we'll be back soon. Thank you for joining us for this episode of British History, Royals, Rebels and Romantics and a special Women's History Month. I'd really appreciate it if you'd leave a rating, maybe share with a friend and think about becoming a patron. I'm so happy to have you with me shaking up history together.